Transcription. Now, before I start talking about kind of the nature of transcription, just why do it? Um, the reason we do it is because usually we find it much easier to work with a transcript rather than a recording. Now these days, like I'm doing here, you can video the, the, the thing, you can have an audio recording of it. That, that's very easy to do. Digital recorders and digital cameras make the whole thing very, very easy to do. <clears throat> but for analysis purposes, people still find it easier to work with the transcript, despite the effort that goes into creating the transcripts. And the reason has to do with the fact that you can move around the transcript. So you can mark it with a pencil. You can shove through the pages very quickly and find the bits you want. And, and you know, you've got some very quick random access to it. You can remember bits because you mark them very easily. Now, they're developing software to help with that. And some of the programs we'll be looking at in a week or so's time do actually deal with some of those kinds of things but still not in quite the same easy, familiar way that we're used to the paper. Um, that becomes even more the case when you're doing very detailed analysis, like conversation analysis or possibly discourse analysis, where you need a closely um, uh, transcribed interview to work on. Um, and I'll show you an example of that later on. In that case, almost certainly you want to transcribe as well, just because you, you need to focus so much on things. But you don't transcribe very much. So I'm afraid transcription is still the norm for anything that, that involves interviews or, uh, or uh, recordings of people. But as Kavala, Steiner Kavala, a Danish um, writer, warns us, we have to be aware of transcripts. Transcripts are not transparent. A transcript is a change of medium. There are dangers in transcribing. We, we tend to lose things. Here are some of those things. The superficial coding um, that we might see, you know, tend to kind of do things without getting the depth of the things. We decontextualize, we take bits out of context because that's what we're focusing on, that passage, and not the, the longer run of the narrative and so on. We miss the bits that came before and after, perhaps, by taking things out of context. So, you know, while they're listening to a longer narrative or longer explanation, we isolate bits and, and, and decontextualize. We may even miss what the larger conversation was about. Above all, then, transcript is a change of medium. We are changing from a written, sorry, from a, a verbal expression to a written expression. Um, things you do verbally in speech, um, you can't do in, in text, or it's very hard to do in text. So you lose some of those things. The intonation, the pace, the speed, the pauses, and so on, are often lost. Perhaps some of the hesitation, some of the garbling, and so on, is lost because it's climbing up, as we'll see. So we often have a cleaner version. Now, if that's important, then you need to be very aware of what you're doing. If it's not important, then it doesn't matter so much. It makes life a bit easier. Well, who should do the transcription? As, as researchers, you'll be faced with this choice at some stage. Um, and I think there are three possibilities. Do it yourself, of course. Uh, getting an audio typist to do it for you. In other words, pay someone. Or use some technology to do it. Let's have a few comments about each of those in turn. Transcription is tedious. It takes an awful long time to do it. Um, <coughs> figures vary. It varies just how good a typist you are, um, how detailed you're doing it, and so on. We'll see the different level of detail you can transcribe. Um, but you might reckon something in the order of, of six hours per hour of recording. Fully transcribe and check something. Maybe you can do it faster, maybe you do it four hours for an hour, maybe it takes you longer but reckon on that kind of figure. So you can see it's a very laborious process, very tedious. On the other hand, it does start you reading your data, or rather, listening to your data, uh, and then perhaps rereading it as you transcribe it. You begin to get familiar with your data. So that's, there is an advantage to that enormous effort you spend on, on doing the transcription. You carefully read it and produce new ideas as you check it through against the, the, um, the audio. And, of course, you may have to do it yourself because the original interviews are in a language that nobody else can transcribe for you. So if you're an anthropologist or if you're doing work in, in another country where there are no native speakers locally you can use to help you transcribe it, then you're lumbered. You have to do it yourself. So, uh, so there you are. You've got to take the hit, so to speak. There are various ways of doing it, transcription. And here's one approach. 
um, which I've seen recommended, um, the three-stage process. So you, you kind of, level one, you go through and log the tape. So you listen through to the tape, get familiar with it as you listen through to it. Just listen through the whole thing in a go, in one go. Um, and create a kind of table of contents. So just take notes as you go through. You know, just a word or two, say that's coming up, that's coming up. And it helps you know what's there. Then make a rough transcription. So you might actually type up your notes into a word processor and then open up the file, start the tape again, and as you come to each of your notes, you can extend it, uh, type some more in. Pause the tape if you need to, but, but try not to, and never rewind the tape. Um, don't go back and re-listen to things. Try to avoid that. We're trying to speed things up here. I've heard it takes two to three hours of tape to go through and do that. It's, it's, of course, you, you, unless you can type very fast, you'll have to pause. So. But try not to rewind, because that does take an awful lot of time. Um, once you've done that, you'll have something that's readable, you'll have lots of typos perhaps, there'll be bits of the missing, bits not quite right and so on. So at that stage, you need to go through again and listen to the recording against the transcript and make sure it's accurate. In that case, you, know, you need to edit it basically, get it correct. And that takes another, you know, whatever it is, um, two hours perhaps for, for an hour of recording to do that, maybe longer. But that's, some people have found that a quite useful method. Again, it's up to you. If you prefer to do things accurately from the go, fine. Best of all is if you can borrow a transcription machine or use digital recordings. Now, if you're doing recordings on audio tapes, little cassettes, then I certainly advise you to borrow a transcription machine. The advantage of a transcription machine are twofold. One is you control it with a foot pedal. So you can sit on your computer typing while you're turning it on and off with your foot. That's great. The other thing is that transcription machines have built in an automatic rewind. So every time you pause it, before it starts playing again, when you, when you start it playing, it rewinds a small amount. And you can often change that. Most machines you can actually vary the amount of rewind from perhaps half a second to two seconds, whatever you want. Actually, round about a second is probably okay. When you pause something on the machine, you lose a bit. You normally lose about half a second. And actually, half a second is about one or two words that you miss. So you need to rewind. And actually, having you rewind a bit more than that sometimes helpful because you can hear the overlap. So, certainly, if you're doing it off audio tapes, cassettes, then get a transcription machine. The alternative is if you're using digital recordings, uh, little MP3 recorders and things like that, or the fancy ones that we have in the school, the Edderol machines that can do MP3s and WAV files, which are higher quality. Um, if you can use those, again, get those on the computer, transfer the files onto the computer, and then there's software you can get that enables you to play it back. And I found that very useful because although you might have to stop it, well, you can get keys, the foot, foot pedals again that work with the software, but you don't need that. Just an F key will usually pause the recording. And the thing about a digital recording is it, it pauses absolutely the minute you press the button. You don't lose anything, as you do on a cassette. So when you restart again, you normally press the same button to restart it restarts exactly at the point you stopped. I don't know if you've probably had the experience with your iPod, if you pause your iPod, when you start it again, it starts at just the very moment you stopped it, exactly, within a millisecond, so you don't lose anything. So actually, it's slightly easier to do transcription using that, that sort of thing. Okay, if you, if you can, though, get some money. Um, and I, I do this when I apply for grants and things, normally make sure there's enough money in the grant to pay somebody else to transcribe. So. I haven't transcribed anything for about all oh, ten years or so now. Um, I remember it. I remember being a very tedious and, and you know dispiriting activity. Particularly at one one stage, I was I was transcribing from a videotape, and all I had was a video machine. Now that's awful because when you pause on that, you lose about two seconds. You keep having to rewind it and so on. Awful. So don't ever do that. Don't try and transcribe a videotape. Get it transferred to someone else first. Um, but uh, yeah, if you can pay somebody else to do it, fine. Um, it's quicker, costs money, typists make mistakes, and you need to make sure you check it. So you can't avoid the checking. And that's the handout I've given you. It's an example from uh, a Canadian researcher some years ago, Carl Cunio. We put this on uh, one of the email lists that I was on. Some examples of his own work. He was researching uh, trade unionism in, in Canada. And uh, here are some of the mistakes he found in checking through what a, trans what a uh, transcriber a typist had done. So instead of um, actually typing labor market, she typed layer market and so on. Uh, of course, sometimes he even got opposite um, transcriptions, so the, the bottom section. So 
the person actually said, actually said never meant to, and the transcriber typed it as ever meant to, and so on. So it shows you some of the kinds of mistakes you've got to watch out for when you're checking other people's transcription. It helps if the typist knows something about the context, um, because if they know about what's going on and what to expect, um, then it helps. So if it's somebody who takes a medical thing and is a medical typist you're using, then great, they'll, they'll know about the context and they'll be able to transcribe the right words and so on. Particularly technical terms, medical terms, simple terms, those kind of things are quite hard to transcribe. So either help the typist by giving you giving them a, a set of those terms or find someone who knows the area. I put here typists are vulnerable too. Um, if you've got some data that might upset the, the typists, then you need to check that out with them. Um, and um, I did some interviews recently with somebody who was working with um, um, I forgot what they call it now um, bondage, that's right, bondage uh, people who are into bondage so she had interviewees and she was talking about interviewees doing all sorts of, of things with, with uh, bondage materials now if you think your typist might be upset by hearing that, you need to warn them and perhaps get somebody else to do it and so on so it's a, it's a matter of sensitivity to that um, and of course, it could be worse than that. I mean, it could be uh, you know, secret things or things that are illegal or whatever. Again, you need to be for that. Right? Although you're not typing it, again, you've got to check it. So you can use that checking as a first opportunity to get familiar with the, the, the transcript and begin to see what, what it's. So remind yourself of what, what, what the interview is about. The third possibility is to use software, technology, to help you transcribe. Um, and there is now software available that, that basically you can dictate to, and it converts your, your words, your dictation, into typed text. Um, and you can see I've got the names here, Via Voice and Dragon Dictator, two other systems. There are, I think, the one or two others. Um, but um, I've used them, and they're not that good. They're not that accurate. They, um, they tend to be very good quality sound, so you have to have your special mics if you normally get one with the package. Um, and you need to teach it with your voice. So you can't use it on your respondent's tapes, even if they're very high quality tapes. You can't play your respondent to it and then get another one and then another one, because it recognises the voice and it will go completely wrong in the second voice. And you need to train it anyway, you need to train it on your voice. And one thing you can do with it is to, to do both things at once, listen to your tape and speak it again into the software. Now, I've tried that. It's very hard to do it. You have to get used to doing it. It's a bit like parallel translation almost. So you hear something coming in your ear, and then you say the same words, speaking into the mic, which then gets um, converted into, into text on the computer. Now, I, I, colleagues say they've done that. And, and you know, at the best, you can get it fairly accurate. But even so, only about 95% accuracy, which sounds good. But, um, yeah, sorry? About that. Do what, sorry? What about regional accent? You had to teach it. So if you've got a regional accent, that's fine. I find, I, I, if I speak slightly American, it's better for me, but I'm, you don't have to. Um, I, just, I just find that, but maybe that's just me. Um, but you do need to persevere with it. You need to train it in your own voice, and it should pick up regional accents. In fact, there are now different versions for international accents. So there's, there's a version for British English, there's a version for American English, there's a version for Indian English, and so on. So even those are covered to some extent. But Yorkshire versus Lancashire versus London, it should cover that, but, you know, okay. see how you get on. So. so if you want to play around the software, have a go. But it's, it's maybe easier than typing if you can't type. Once you've got the transcripts, they need to be accurate. Um, and um, you can go back to the participants and check with them that this is an accurate um, recording of what they said, or rather what they meant, actually. And that's the trouble. They remember what they meant not what they said, because you've got the record of what they said. I, I can guarantee you that you, know, you can make it accurate from, from what they said. So what if they disagree with the transcript? And that's the trouble we're going back to, to check the transcript with the participants. Well, you can try and treat it as new data. So you, they've said one thing, and a week later you come back with the transcript, and they disagree with what, what, what they said there. Well, they said it, like, for sure. That may be not what they meant to say, but that's what they actually said. So why are they changing their minds? You can ask them. You know, is it embarrassment? Is there something that's happened in the meantime? Maybe their boss has talked to them and they don't want to you know, reveal these things anymore. Maybe they've actually changed their mind themselves. 
or maybe there are other peer pressures that are making them change their mind. So you could treat it in that kind of way and keep both the old data and the new data and treat the whole thing as a, as a kind of, of exercise in, in you know, focusing in on the really crucial things that are, that are risking it. However, interviewees might want the statements erased, they might want it cut, and usually they have the right to do that. They would have signed a, you know, a fully informed consent form that says they can withdraw at any moment. So um, they, they've got the right to say, I don't want that used, or I'll withdraw completely. Um, so you're stuck with it. So you can try and persuade them of the former, <laughs> but they might think that would be better. Or don't do it at all. Um, and I have to say, to a large extent, I wouldn't even bother doing this, but it, it is turning quite popular, I think, to do these kind of things. <coughs> Well, I've talked about transcriber making errors, but the errors occur for all sorts of reasons um, when you do it and when, when another scientist does it. A good quality recording helps. So if it's poor quality recording, it will be harder to hear what's on it. And even if it's you doing your own transcription, listening to your own voice and, and the respondent who you interviewed a week before, you'll have forgotten what was being said in the interim. So a good quality recording is quite vital. And I find a, a good microphone, a, a, a lapel mic, works really well. And one that sticks on, these little sort of battery inside it. Sticks on there, just plugs in with a normal kind of uh, bayonet plug into the, the recorder. That works really well. Um, poor quality transcription machine, another problem. Um, sometimes it's better to go back to a hi-fi cassette player to get the best quality sound out of it. I find transcription machines are not terribly good in the hi-fi states. But, um, and let you sort of see what you think there. Actually, I actually have to say that digital recordings are normally by far the best. And the best quality recordings, as long as the microphone's good, you'll get a very good quality recording. So that's the handout I've given you of the, the transcribers' errors.